The church's victory, as I've already said, said tonight, will involve two elements. The first is purification, and the second is empowering. Now, I don't mean that other things aren't going on at the same time, but I think the, the emphases of the 90s will be purification and empowering. I believe the process has begun. Have you thought about the proliferation of ideas, how it works? You see, one aspect of the kingdom of God, as you look at parables in the, in the New Testament, you get the, the picture of, of a seed that, that multiplies, of, of uh, leavening that changes a whole lump. And there are many images like that. You, you get the idea of things expanding and things growing from little starts to big finishes. Kingdom of God, right? You've read the Bible, right? New Testament, parables about the kingdom. Go like that. It'll help me. and I'll feel better. Thank you. About nine years ago, I had been into this process about a year and a half at the time, struggling. Things were not going well. I mean, we couldn't get anybody well. We got sick praying for the sick. My friend Ken Gullickson asked me to go up to the valley and teach at his church. And a little group showed up and full of skepticism, looking me over. I taught about healing. Then they asked me to pray for people, and I prayed for a bunch of people. And as far as I could tell, not a single person even got a little bit better, much less well. I thought, I'm going to quit this damn job. <laughs> I'm going to get myself some good Ray Steadman outlines, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to teach. You know, I'm going to teach the Word. That's a lot safer place. Are you hearing me? That's what I was hurt inside. I got in a car, and I'm driving along the freeway, coming home, you know, through the valley and back into into Orange County, and I'm I'm talking to God and and uh, you know apologizing for cussing and you know <laughs> confessing for cussing, excuse me, and uh, which I'll have to do it later again tonight. And uh, <laughs> and I'm driving along, and all of a sudden the, the Spirit of God begins speaking to me. He just broke into my thought. I mean, I'm whining and complaining. <laughs> bad enough to be fat and old and redheaded. I've had freckles all my life and other kids had tans, you know, and stuff. And here I am now, you got me praying for the sick and nobody gets well. And where were you, by the way, when I was back there praying for those people? <laughs> Says in the book, you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I love quoting those verses to him. <laughs> you weren't asleep in a boat again, were you? A spiritual giant, I'm not, okay? <laughs> I mean, I joined up because I was weak and needed a Savior. So I, I drive around, I'm talking to him, and all of a sudden he gives me this powerful impression. Just, you know, sometimes the Lord can speak to you like in a collage. You, you get a whole bunch of information in just one instant like that. And I got the picture of um, uh, California, 23 million people. I knew that there was approximately uh, one church for every 10,000 people in California. And that, that uh, uh, if we filled them all to overflowing uh, six times every Sunday, we would still have nearly half the population without a place to go. I didn't, and, and, and we weren't. You know, we, weren't, we have a small percentage, about 28% of the people in church on Sunday. And then the Lord, the Lord gave me that impression. Then on top of that, he gave me the impression. He said, do you realize how few there are that pray for the sick? Well, I never thought about that. He gave me a distinct impression that it was just a minuscule number of places in the whole country where you could go and anybody would even, you know, dare expect healing for cancer or blindness or something like that. And then he spoke to me on a, at yet another level and said, if you'll be faithful, I'll multiply this over the whole earth. And I just began sobbing. 
Now that was nine, a little over nine years ago. I've been to 17 nations. We've had several hundred thousand leaders over the years in our meetings. There are thousands upon thousands of Christians today praying for the sick that were not doing it 10 years ago. God multiplies our efforts, but we must be faithful. And I'm not saying that it's easy. It's hard. I've quit a thousand times along the way, but he won't let me quit. This keeps goading me, makes me get back up and do it again. But in these last days, nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. And then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And I think, frankly, that would be the good news. I'd much rather be put to death than talk to death. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, I want you to see the relationship between the increase of wickedness and the love of most growing cold. I think that's the phenomenon. I think that's the warp and the woof. I think that's what's going on today. And it's so insidious, it's so cleverly uh, veiled that we, we don't even know that we're in the grips of it. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole earth as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, if there's anything you should understand as you leave here tonight, it's what the gospel of the kingdom is. It's been proclaimed to you this week. It's been, it's been revealed. It's been communicated. It's been illustrated. And I believe we're to preach it over the whole earth. Now, in those early days, I, I, had, I had some theological reference points. I had read all of Ladd's material. I had read Ritterboss. I had had uh, some exposition and some teaching from some uh, very solid uh, biblical people in various settings around the country. I had, I had some Bible teaching about it. But I didn't know how to get it off these pages and into to these chubby legs, you know, and to get it going. And I was struggling with it. And circumstances evolved, and, and David Watson showed up here, and uh, well, not at this building, but at the, at the church when we were over in the canyon, and, and said, "Hey, come to York, and you know, uh, uh, we really need what you're doing." And I thought, "What are we doing that you need?" I, I, see, I didn't have any context, I didn't have any understanding. I was, I, I saw it as, uh, as sort of a lavatory. I saw us just sort of trying to work things out. You know, uh, put your hand here and pray. You know, try it. Turn around and do it this way. You know? I mean, we would have worn nails in our eyes if we thought we could have got something going. And it was beginning to happen. There was a trickle of it. But it wasn't, it wasn't really there yet. And, and David said, come on. He said, you can bless us. You can help us. You can encourage us. So we went off to England. And we, we got to, to Charlie Wood. And it was, it was, I mean, it was colossal. I mean, I couldn't believe it. We're in this little suburb of London, and, and, and uh, uh, the, this church is packed out. It's an Anglican church, and, and, and the Lord just devastated those people. Knocked them up and down and over and around, and here are these state Englishmen running over the tops of the pews after two days. <laughs> out of their minds, you know. Bob Fulton's praying for this old lady that has arthritis and suddenly she's shouting and he can't understand what she's saying and her, and her uh, niece says, she sees, she sees. And Bob got so excited he went outside and threw up. <laughs> she sees.
He's praying for arthritis. I don't think she ever did get any help with her arthritis. And so we saw our first eyes open and we saw the first person coming out of a wheelchair, a woman with MS, 16 years in a wheelchair. Out she came and walked the periphery of the building. People just went out of their minds. I saw young people trying to, to climb over other people so they could get out of that place because they were so scared and the Spirit of God grabbing them and shaking the snot right out of them. <laughs> just... And some of those young people are in the ministry today. They didn't want to get saved. They just wanted to get out of there. <laughs> but God got them. And that was just warmers. You know, we, we got that. We, having been warmed up, we went off to York. And over the next few days, it happened again. And this time, it was much bigger. We had a lot more people, and, and a lot more of it happened. And, and we were just absolutely uh, stunned with it. Now, you've got to understand that during that period of time and the, and the months prior to that, I had been saying, the kingdom of God, Lord, show me the kingdom of God. Show me the kingdom of God. So there we are on the, the, at the depot and the train, and David Watson has uh, graciously come down to see us off the train. And a friend of his is there, a bishop from, uh, an Anglican bishop from, from uh, Africa, and he's chiding David, kidding him, and he says, well, what kind of report are you going to write on this ministry? He had been at the meetings. And David turned very articulately and with kind of fire in his eyes, says, I don't think I'll have any problem writing a ministry, writing a report on a ministry where the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Yeah. And when he said that, it was like a blow to my solar plexus. And I remember, there was these big pillars there. And I just leaned back against it like that. And I thought, my God, the kingdom is here. And that was the first revelation, the first realization that what I'd been looking for that was so mystical and so hard to get a hold of and so, so exasperating that we were walking in it, that somehow we'd broken through. And that we'd, I, I didn't know exactly how we'd gotten there, but we were there. The difficulty was I couldn't keep a hold of it. I couldn't can it and put it in my pockets or wrap it up and put it in my billfold. It just, it was so, it's always been so exasperating. Believing it and, and attempting to do it, it, it it's flitting. It, it comes and goes. There's anointing one time and not anointing the next time. And you get weary and well-doing and you get, you get discouraged and you just want to give up. And about the time you want to give up, God does some incredible thing and it... <laughs> Hooks you again, and off you go, you know. Huh? We haven't seen anything yet. It's beginning. Think of it this way. I mean, in, 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 put it in any context, but I can only put it in mine. It wasn't very many years ago that all the people that I knew that was trying to do this fit in my living room. Are you hearing me? And now when we go to countries, we have to rent venues and find places and have meetings all over the countries because 30, 40, 50,000 people come out because they want to get equipped to do this work. All of my Christian life, I've been hearing about equipping the saints, but no one did it to me. But it's beginning to happen now. We're just beginning. This is the beginning of it, folks. It's not time to get tired yet. The mission of the church in the last days. First of all, the basics remain the same. Evangelism is the primary mission activity of, for the expansion or the extension of the church. It's not the only thing the church is, but it's a thing that the church does. Church planting is the most effective means of that. To evangelize without churching people is incomplete. Signs and wonders will accompany the gospel. As we proclaim it, God will back up His act. 
One of the warnings that I have here is what I shared with you earlier, that we cannot equate gifted and anointed people as necessarily being imprimatur of God because they may be impure and may have turned to sin. If they have, then God will deal with them. So we have to be very careful in the selection of our leaders. They've got to be godly people.